Right, so let's start with a very short uh, video and clarification of the sphericity assumption in within subjects in ANOVA. And this is sort of a, a little bit of an expansion on what we talked about in class in interpreting Mockley's test of sphericity. This is a tough concept to wrap your head around. It's even tougher to teach, really, because um, there's so much going on in this that uh, just trying to verbally explain what happens with this test is challenging and, and it's hard to do. And, and I can tell you that when I did it with the morning section uh, on Thursday, um, I wasn't quite sure that I was getting the point across as much as I'd like. And the reason that I know that is because this was pretty much the look that every student in class was giving me. And when I see that look, I start thinking, you know, even though I might kind of understand what's going on here, I'm not getting this across to the students well enough. So we got to think of another way of doing this. So um, yeah, I reflected on that a little bit and, and said, okay, let's do something a little bit more visual. Let's see if that works. So let's walk through exactly what's happening um, to evaluate the assumption of sphericity using Mockley's test. Let's start with a, a data set hypothetical. These are uh, mental health patients who are coming in for, say, th psychotherapy. They're measured on a scale of global function that could go from zero to 100, so higher scores are better. And they're measured at pre-treatment, post-treatment, and six months. So subject one is going to be measured three times. Subject two, measured three times. That allows us to calculate means for each of the levels. And what we're seeing here is that the means are increasing over time, which is what we'd like to see, you know, with therapy. What we don't know is whether these increases are more than what we would expect uh, just based on sampling error in chance. Okay, so we're seeing increases, but it could be kind of random fluctuations. We won't know until we run the F ratio. Okay, so there are our data. Okay, and we could have a whole bunch of subjects, so I haven't put all the data in here. Uh, these are the means that we ended up if we were looking at uh, all of the data. Okay, so how does uh, the sphericity assumption work? Well, let's go back to our data set and we'll see here, here's the data that you just saw on the last screen. What we're going to do to evaluate the sphericity assumption is to calculate different scores for each subject across all possible combinations of levels. Now, what does that actually look like? Well, there are three possible contrasts here because I have three levels. There's a contrast where I can look at the difference in scores from A1 to A2, in other words, from pretreatment to post-treatment within the same subject, A1 to A3, pretreatment to six-month follow-up within the same subject, and then A2 to A3, which is post-treatment to six-month follow-up within the same subject. So if we look at subject one, 20 minus 35, 20 minus 35 is negative 15. So that's the A1, A2 contrast. And there's a difference of 15 for subject one. We do that again for subject two. 40 minus 50 is negative 10. Boom. 60 minus 90 is negative 30. Boom. 50 minus 50 is zero right there. And then 30 minus 25 is five. Got it? So you're, you're looking at the difference scores within a particular contrast. You do that again for the other contrast, so A1 minus A3. 20 minus 40 is negative 20. 40 minus 40 is 0. 60 minus 70 is negative 10. 50 minus 60 is negative 10. 30 minus 50 is negative 20. And then you follow up with A2 minus A3. 35 minus 40 is negative 5. 50 minus 40 is 10, and so forth. You get the idea. So what you're going to then see here is that these scores are not, these different scores are not equal, right? They're clearly not equal. Okay, so uh, they exhibit variability. So what we're going to do is essentially then compute the variance within the A1, A2 contrast, the variance within the A1, A3 contrast, and the variance within the A2, A3 contrast. And I'm not going to walk through all of the math here, but you know how to calculate sum of squares and variance, right? So we basically take these deviation scores, we take the average A1, A2 contrast mean difference, we'd compute, it, we'd, uh, compute um, the overall variation of scores from sum of squares, and let's just say we end up with variance down here of 40, okay? Uh, so once the variance is computed for A1, A2, let's just say it's 40. For A1, A3, let's say it's 90. And then A2, A3, let's just say it's 100, okay? 
So the sphericity assumption basically assumes that these variances in the contrasts are equal to one another. There are three variances that are compared. So the null hypothesis for Moxley's is that all three of these variances will be equal to one another. The alternative hypothesis, in other words, when you can get a statistically significant Moxley's result, is that at least one of the variances is significantly different from one of the other variances. Okay, now here's the thing. That's a pretty common outcome. Um, it's actually very common to see a statistically significant Moxley, uh, Moxley's result. Okay, so Moxley comes out um, as statistically significant. The effect of a statistically significant violation then of the sphericity assumption is to increase the type 1 error rate. So um, essentially, as the F ratio is being calculated, uh, this creates a condition in which um, because there are variances between uh, the contrasts that are not equal to one another, it becomes much easier to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so the null hypothesis is uh, for Mockley's is that uh, the variances are equal. It's usually the case that they're not. Um, that means that we then have to do a correction and that's the greenhouse geyser correction. And what the greenhouse geyser does without getting into a bunch of very obscure math is that it effectively modifies the degrees of freedom used to calculate the F ratio so that it's no longer biased toward that type one, increased type one error rate, rejecting the null hypothesis. So what I really want you to do is just fo focus on the effect of greenhouse geyser. Remember that in statistics, we are using sample data to generalize back to the population, to make inferences about the population. So this correction um, effectively reduces the likelihood that we are going to make type one errors when generalizing back to uh, the population. Um, again, we're not gonna go into the math behind greenhouse geysers. Suffice it to say at this point that what happens is that the degrees of freedom are modified to some extent. So when you actually look at the, the output, you could get some kind of weird looking degrees of freedoms, you know, fractional amounts of, of degrees of freedom and, and so forth. Now you have to report those. So, uh, so the proper thing to do when you're uh, going through the within subjects analysis is check first to see if Moxley's is uh, statistically significant. And if it is, then use the row in the ANOVA table that says greenhouse geyser. That's the greenhouse geyser correction. So the first row is going to show you, basically going to show you sphericity assumed. The very next row is going to show you greenhouse geyser correction. That's the row that you want to look across for the F ratio. And then in that's also the row that's going to include the data that you're going to report in your write-up. So you want to report the F ratio in the, in the write-up from the greenhouse geyser correction. Okay, so I hope that that is a little bit more helpful in terms of understanding, you know, what's going on. Uh, again, I know that the explanation is highly descriptive because I don't think it's particularly useful to go in and, you know, tear apart exactly all of those calculations and, and so forth. What I just want you to come away from with this is that, um, you know, the sphericity assumption is routinely violated with the within subjects ANOVA. There is a correction for it. The effect of that correction is to return the type one error rate back to an acceptable level. Okay. And the effect for you as a researcher is that you've got to read across the right row in the SPSS output. Look for that greenhouse geyser correction and the F ratio associated with it.